Hi, I'm Netta Spencer. Today, uh, we want to talk about, um, I don't know what. That's why we have a schmooze day. Sometimes we're not sure what is on people's minds. So we like to give people a chance every now and then, like once a week, to schmooze. That is, I, I'm not sure what that word really means. It's probably a Yiddish word or something, but I, I think it means something like talk without an agenda just explore whatever you're interested in so i like to invite people in as if they're people strangers who don't know each other and i'm inviting them to 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 lunch or something to meet uh at my house and and we'll find out we'll get acquainted we'll have a conversation uh with my two guests mariana mary ellen franker is a sister of service uh, here in Toronto. She's a nun and she's uh, a peace activist, big time. She's very, very engaged with peace work. And that I think is her her calling, her mission in the world. And uh, she's just been telling me that her order is about to celebrate their 100th anniversary. And Neil Arya is a physician in uh, Waterloo or Kitchener, which is it? Well, Neil, where are you nowadays? Uh, more in Kitchener than Waterloo, but uh, live in Waterloo, 10 minutes away. Yeah, those are two cities that run together here in Ontario, and I never know which city I'm in when I go there. Anyway, uh, Dr. Neil Area is uh, very engaged with the physicians movement. That is uh, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, Canada because <laughs> that's their, our Canadian branch of this international organization, which actually won the Nobel Peace Prize a number of years ago and has been was uh, extremely influential during the Cold War, in, uh, especially with uh, Gorbachev. I think he had some influence on his uh, policies. Maybe, in fact, Neil, refresh my memory on what it was that um, that the IPPNW did that won the Nobel Peace Prize. Do you remember? Um, well, I uh, the year that they won the Nobel Peace Prize, I was in first year medicine. So many of us say we, we uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize, but I'm not sure I had a lot to do with it. Uh, so I, 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 I claim to, to have uh, four or five Nobel Prizes myself, because I belong to a number of organizations that tend to get Nobel Prizes. So you and I are both Nobel Peace Prize winners. <laughs> anyway, but, go on. Um, what what was it they were, were particularly honored for, do you call? Um, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of a long explanation for that. Uh, so back in the early 60s, uh, people like Bernard Lowen and Vic Seidel, Jack Geiger, were involved in studies of uh, what an attack on Boston uh, by uh, the nuclear weapons that were there at the time, just a small attack would mean. And uh, basically you would have 100 million people dead in the US and if the US retaliated the same in the Soviet Union, uh, there wouldn't be enough burn beds uh, if you just had a small attack on the city of Boston, there wouldn't be enough burn beds in all of the US to manage the victims, uh, all of the mm -hmm. infrastructure in terms of uh, um, uh, the roads, the uh, uh, water supply, electricity, all of course would be destroyed, uh, much more than what we see in Ukraine these days that we're concerned <laughs> about. 98% of physicians and other health personnel would would die. And uh, out of this movement developed Physicians for Social Responsibility in the U.S., which uh, uh, really acted against the Vietnam War in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s. And then in 1980, uh, Bernard Lown, who was an expert in sudden cardiac death, uh, the inventor of the defibrillator, uh, united with uh, a Soviet colleague, Evgeny Chazov. Uh, and, uh, and Laun and Chazov uh, uh, were, thought it was ridiculous that uh, they were trying to save lives at an individual basis with sudden cardiac death. Uh, but uh, uh, meanwhile, their countries were looking at uh, killing uh, 
a hundred million people in a winnable war. Mm. And uh, so this message resonated with a lot of people in those two countries and many countries outside. Uh, you had people like Helen Caldicott, the Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, who's uh, highlighted in a film, uh, If You Love This Planet, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, sensitizing the U.S. public, uh, got an Academy Award, I believe, for uh, Best Documentary, but was banned in the U.S. And uh, as such, uh, 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 with Chazoff uh, being a cardiologist, he ended up being the cardiologist to a lot of the Soviet uh, uh, leadership, with most of them being older men who yeah. tend to have cardiac problems. And uh, so it was uh, uh, because of that, this message that nuclear war could not be winnable in a meaningful way and therefore should not be fought, Gorbachev uh, ended up agreeing to arms cuts that his generals felt didn't make sense because the U.S. was getting some advantage. And he said, well, if, if we can't really use these weapons anyway, it's not going to matter if we've got a few fewer. And so, uh, so IPPNW won the Nobel Peace Prize in 85, and Gorbachev uh, credited uh, IPPNW in, I think, 87 or 88 in his book Perestroika, uh, really with changing his way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's a long explanation. It is, but it is it's worth remembering. I recall most of it, uh, you know, because uh, unlike you, I wasn't in first year of medical school. I was already a professor and spending half my time doing piecework. Uh, so I was going to Russia a lot in those days. And, and uh, I know how important, uh, uh, how influential the movement was uh, in especially Gorbachev's thinking. Anyway, Mary Ellen, uh, how are you today? And uh, tell us what's going on uh, in your world. I think you said the, the Sisters of Service has uh, been around for uh, 100 years, and you're going to be celebrating that. Uh, how many people have been uh, active in the Sisters of Service, and what do you do? Well, we've never been a terribly large community. We've We've been, we've focused our ministry in Canada and mostly in places that could be forgotten. So in the, the more isolated areas. And it's just as, as history has evolved and we've aged, mm -hmm. uh, we've tend to be more in the, uh, in the cities. How, how, many, how many other sisters are there in your order? Well, we're now just 11 people, 11 okay. women. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, we've, we acknowledge that we are dying out. Uh, and so though we live every day, you know, as fully as we can, always in ministry in some way. And it just, uh, I've been called, I've been drawn to, uh, to be involved in peace and justice work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, since being in Toronto and during COVID, amazingly, um, the peace movement has really grown, as you know yourself, Meta. And so, you know, now to the point of having a Canada wide network that meets on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, but it has really led to Canada wide uh, actions. Um, so recently around, of course, Ukraine, and also <clears throat> this past weekend, the war in Yemen. What happened this weekend about Ye Yemen that your group has been uh, addressing? Oh, dear. Well, uh, Saturday, the 26th, was the actual seventh anniversary of the starting of the war in Yemen. Mm -hmm. So it was just a highlighting of the fact this war has now been waging for seven years. So they're now starting their, the eighth year. And, and it's particularly uh, important to be giving attention to them because they're so aware that, that the war in Ukraine has really taken the world's attention. Mm -hmm. So that the Yemenis people kind of are feeling like, are we totally forgotten? Mm -hmm. Nobody seems to really be doing very much to help us. 
So it was partly just to say to the, the Yemenis people, we, we are with mm -hmm. you. We across Canada really remember you and we're still working to, um, to bring an end to that war. So in both cases, both the Ukraine and in Yemen, uh, one of the big issues is militarism uh, in the sense that the world is supplying the weapons that can keep the war going. Um, and that in both cases, Canada is supplying weapons. So my, my great concern, because of the, the peace movement um, is very concerned with the ongoing um, myth that militarism can solve all conflicts mm -hmm. um, and can bring peace where, um, you know, I mean, we're saying it's only the nonviolent path that can possibly bring lasting peace. And now the added dimension uh, that we're also in the world facing a crisis in, in climate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I mean, we just had the recent IPCC report that again told us if we don't do something very soon, we're in major difficulty. Well, we may not survive as a humanity. Yeah. So, in fact, what is very hard to educate people to is that the uh, defense and militarism are the highest emitters of carbon. So that and, and that the added dimension is that decisions have been made at world meetings where, where nation leaders have said, we exempt the defense and military from all the rules around uh, environmental protection and climate protection. So here we've got, certainly in both wars, tremendous use of militarism. So on top of all of the other suffering, they are automatically increasing the, the danger of climate change. But also um, in Ukraine, we know that these weapons can only be functioning if they're constantly being fueled by, by fossil fuels. And that's why the big issue of, of Russia's oil and throwing the whole world into a spin for many reasons but also it is the supplier of militarism. So um, how do you put all this together? And I mean, the politicians don't want to listen to this at all, that here you've got a call for even more fossil fuels, pour out more so that we can keep the, the weapons going. Uh, and at the same time, every time a, a a weapon is used, it's pouring out carbon into the atmosphere and preventing us really from ever meeting our climate goals. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got these two huge uh, issues, world issues mm -hmm. coming together. So that's, that's a very big, and, and it, I was on a webinar the other day, which others here may have also been watching, talking about two crises, one route, and that, that it's, it's the fossil fuels, that's the route. Um, and one woman who was the, uh, representing the Council of Canadians who have a, a, a letter that can be signed on to right now, um, you know, speaking to this, and her saying that, like, maybe one hopeful thing is if we can phase out fossil fuels, and move into renewable energy, that means that weapons won't be able to be fueled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, somebody told me a, a couple of years ago that this was when um, the U.S. Was, had large military presence in Afghanistan. 
And, and um, I understand that 40% of the cost of maintaining that military unit or any military presence in another country uh, must be spent on the um, if transporting the fuel that the weapons and the, the, uh, m the troop uh, placements uh, require just to, to be functional. So that, um, you know, if 40% is just to transport the fuel, and then of course, when they, when they use it, there's, there's a whole other uh, emission there. So uh, the, the use of the fuel in war is certainly something, but now we're having, it seems to be a, a whole new setback, I'm sorry to say, for a peace movement, um, uh, for us, for our side, we've been set back by this war in a number of different ways. Uh, you've mentioned the the problem of of the uh, of Yemen, uh, as I understand it. Uh, it's of course uh, Saudis and the UAE which are uh, attacking Yemen at war with Yemen, and now that um, the uh, Russian oil is not on the market or not being available for people in Europe who really require it. Uh, the U.S. is uh, uh, trying to play nicely with the Saudis to try to uh, ask them to increase the production of, of oil so that the, uh, especially Germany, can make it um, get along with their domestic uh, maintenance of uh, ordinary life uh, uh, without uh, the Russian gas that they've been requiring. So, uh, there's pressure that way. I haven't started off with my usual uh, invitation for both of my guests to tell me what they're interested in. We plunged right in with my asking specific questions about uh, what you uh, should be talking about, and uh, that's too directive. I should back off and let you tell me what's on your mind. Neil, what's on your mind? I've been involved with uh, a Lancet Commission on Peace, Gender, and Health. Uh, so the Lancet Medical Journal uh, has various commissions on different issues. And we put out a statement on Ukraine. It took a lot of uh, discussion when you had 20 different uh, people from different parts of the world, different cultures, uh, to come up with um, what was a consensus, uh, more or less. Um, seeing this as being uh, Russian aggression. Uh, and as you say, Meta, the peace movement often are seen as willing dupes. And uh, it, it, so it, it was challenging. It was also challenging because a lot of the rhetoric around this is a little bit um, anti Eastern European, one could say, even though the Ukrainians are also Eastern European, but it's West versus East, like back in the 80s. Uh, and uh, there's also the concerns that um, there is certainly what I would think would be a, a racist element. Uh, I run a refugee health clinic in Kitchener. I've done that since 2008. And the concern for Ukrainians uh, as people like us, as the civilized and so on, um, isn't uh, what I've heard, certainly uh, not about the Syrians and the Afghans, even if they help the Canadian military uh, measures. So it's important to try to uh, look at that aspect of, uh, mm -hmm. of our concern for Ukraine in what does seem like a, a war of aggression. Uh, it's also tough for us in the peace movement to uh, highlight the other wars of aggression that we've either actively participated in or at least been complicit. And one could say uh, Yemen would be uh, uh, something uh, that, that uh, even Canadian military going to Saudis uh, is something that we haven't talked about. So let alone our own dependence. The Canadian military is... In what way they're especially cooperating with the Saudis? Oh, no, not, not Canadian direct military cooperation, but selling of weapons. Mm -hmm. That uh, 
Uh, mm -hmm. We had a house in London, so it's yes. uh, general dynamics and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, our national government was more concerned about selling those arms rather mm -hmm. than whether the arms would be used uh, internally within Saudi Arabia to suppress dissent or uh, mm -hmm. in uh, Yemen in particular. Of course, uh, you had a lot of powers in Syria. And so uh, trying to make... Uh, uh, those arguments right now is is a bit challenging. In terms of connecting the issues, I'll just bring up another th thing uh, th that, uh, so I chair uh, something called the Pegasus Institute on Peace, uh, Global Health and Sustainability. So it looks at global health, both international and local at its nexus with peace and sustainability. So we definitely do connect those issues much like Project Save the World Meta. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had a number of uh, uh, webinars and roundtables related to each of the issues that we've, uh, uh, we've mentioned. We're going to have a summer institute with McGill University on peace through health and environment and human health. So just wanted to uh, mm -hmm. put a plug in for our Pegasus Institute. Well, tell, tell me a little more about what you're planning. Uh, yes, I, I know I've only been to one of your events about three or four years ago when you uh, you had a something here in Toronto, and I thought it was quite impressive. It was about two or three days long, wasn't it? So what what I, you may have to scale back given the the pandemic and so on. But what is what's in the works? You invite people to give talks about. Uh, the connection between health and uh, and militarism? Uh, among other things, yeah, we did have something with our conferences. We did, did those every two years uh, between 2014, uh, 2016, 2018. We were supposed to have one in 2020. And with the pandemic, we decided not to have a three-day conference, but instead to form a nonprofit to deal with these issues. We've had uh, webinars and roundtables, and out of those, we've actually had different types of action and uh, not specifically related to the international setting like this. We've got research related to gender-based violence in Ecuador, El Salvador, and Tanzania, uh, work on indigenous policing, why that is different than uh, other policing in terms of dealing with incidents with violence, stuff on environmental racism. Uh, so we get different projects that have come out of our public events. We have a Latin American and a Francophone network, the Francophone network concentrating on Francophone Africa. Oh, well, no, wait a minute. Hold on. This is way much more uh, expensive <laughs> than I was aware of. If you're in Latin America and Africa and places, I, I thought this uh, Pegasus Institute was a Canadian uh, you know, local, local project. Sounds like you're growing global. What's, uh, 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 who are these people in Africa and in Latin America? So it starts off with a few more personal connections, but we have people uh, in Ecuador, Peru, Chile, uh, Colombia, Honduras, uh, El Salvador, who are leading the group. Some are physicians, some are social scientists, uh, uh, public health people, community people, Indigenous people, uh, as part of the Latin American network, our Francophone African network. It actually does include uh, issues of asylum seekers in Quebec uh, here too. So we do have Canadians, a couple of people from the U.S., but uh, the main leaders are from uh, uh, Congo and uh, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have some people from Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Tunisia, Lebanon. Uh, so it's just basically getting started, uh, looking at issues of global health, and many of their issues are not the ones that we might concentrate on within Canada. Uh, the Latin American network is concerned about uh, the mercantilization of health, free trade type things. They are concerned about gender-based violence, migration issues. Um, and uh, extractivism. Of, do they get into extractivism and its impact on on uh, water, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Uh, yes, there is some interest with some people there. Uh, with our uh, Pegasus Institute, the Summer Institute on Environment and and Human Health, we will have uh, uh, Jen uh, Moore, who was formerly with Mining Watch, 
Canada, mm -hmm. looking at extractive industries. We've got other people in terms of uh, uh, more the greenwashing of uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the uh, companies now uh, in, in terms of practices when everybody says we're going to be carbon neutral, what that means. Uh, but uh, yeah, so a lot of different ways that they connect the dots. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, tell me about this greenwashing people. <laughs> I, I love the term, but uh, it's certainly uh, uh, a, 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 a pejorative. Uh, you don't want to be called a greenwasher. <laughs> but I don't ex exactly know uh, what that means. It, you say it's people pretending to be carbon neutral or people who aren't? or Yeah, more or less. And it's like, mining companies too, where their corporate social responsibility arms, sometimes uh, they do very good things and they're people with very good intentions. But other times it is just to put a different uh, paint on, on things mm. and make you think differently. So in terms of uh, uh, those policies, whether it be banks or airlines or whatever, you could have one part of your company which deals in a certain way that is mm -hmm. carbon neutral and the other parts aren't, or you have your domestic operations versus international operations uh, running differently. So there are different ways in which you can say that you're working for the environment and be being carbon neutral, but not uh, truly operating in that way. And the military does that. The mm -hmm. other thing that, uh, the corporate sector sometimes uh, can do uh, is uh, astroturfing. Uh, so Ooh. the creation of grassroots groups that are funded entirely by them. Pharma has also used that in terms of uh, in, in terms of patient interest groups. So so these are just different tactics. That's a, that, a new term for me. Astroturfing. That's that's a, a cute. <laughs> Uh, a description of a uh, fakery, I guess. Uh, yeah. Grassroots without roots. All right. Very interesting. One of the things that I'm I'm really interested in the trying to project and anticipate the um, the outcome of the meanings that are being created in this this war, uh, because. Um, you know, the militarists have really won the day uh, in terms of public opinion now. Everyone realizes that uh, that Russia's attack on Ukraine it has to be stopped. Of course, different people try to put the blame in various places, but, but everybody, I think, pretty much sees that we, we need to put an end to it. Uh, but nevertheless, the only things that I hear about are people who are talking about uh, how to help uh, Ukraine win. Um, well, I, if I have a choice between Russia and the Ukraine, I f absolutely prefer for Ukraine to win. But uh, I'm not sure uh, that that is the, uh, the end of the matter, or uh, it really it, it involves um, stoking the fire with... Uh, um, you know, this whole fossil fuel industry, uh, pouring uh, fossil fuels on the flames, if you will. And um, yeah, uh, so I think we've had a real setback in terms of the fact that nobody right now is talking about how to to end the conflict by using nonviolent means. Um, I, I hear very little about the possibility of using, for example, uh, civilian-based defense uh, in Ukraine to prevent um, the um, invasion or uh, occupation of the country. And um, I, th I think this is, you know, whether or not right at the moment the Ukrainians are ahead, uh, we still have to look at the still there's a possibility that this will turn into a real occupation. And this would be the time to start uh, preparing people to be able to resist it nonviolently. Have, have you, have either of your groups been talking uh, about how to assist nonviolent civil resistance, either 
in uh, in in uh, Ukraine if it is invaded and occupied, or uh, right now in in Russia, where uh, the opponents of the war are forbidden to even say the word. Uh, they're not. They, they can be jailed for fifteen years just for finding out something that people don't want them to know. So I think we have our work ahead of us, um, or we should be doing it better than we are right now in terms of looking at nonviolent resistance um, yeah. practices. That it's to really um, somehow encourage all nations to realize that that is, in the end, the most helpful for a long-range lasting peace that the, a militaristic approach may supposedly win in the moment. But you know that the, the, all of the dynamics are going to continue and that there will be other wars and it, it's just going to, going to continue. I mean, I think the, the civil resistance is, is definitely a, a, a really important tool to show, first of all, that the nonviolent way does work, but also to open the space for then much more negotiation to bring nations to a place where everyone is if you want winning, but it, but I mean, I don't think it's helpful to think about winning and losing, but that there is a, an order, a, a mechanism of security that will prevent the uprising or the resurgence of, of conflicts. If, if conflicts do begin to emerge somewhat, then hopefully they're attended to quickly rather than allowing for ex, um, um, escalation. Um, it, it is so important that, that the world begin to see the, a very different way forward. Um, right now is such a difficult time though, because if you, I, I'm, I, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago, when the war was beginning, uh, on one of these schmooze days, I said my opinion was, it wasn't clear then who was going to win or who would be uh, outflanked uh, militarily. And I thought the Russians were likely to s just triumph immediately. And I said, you know, if I were Zelensky, I would say, okay, we, uh, we don't want to be defeated. So you guys come on in. If you're going to come in, uh, you, we won't we won't fight you militarily. But you should realize that when we when you get in here, we're not going to cooperate. And then they should prepare people to do what the uh, people in Czechoslovakia did when after the uh, um, the that first Prague Spring, when the Russians came in and occupied the country, they maintained uh, non-cooperation. And they, they, they simply made it impossible for the Russians to accomplish any of their goals. Uh, this went on for many months, uh, even though they hadn't prepared in advance. The same thing was true in, in Denmark, you know, when the uh, Danes resisted, nonviolently resisted the Nazi occupiers. So uh, you can do things uh, to make it impossible for the uh, occupation to, to win. Right now, though, with uh, with Ukraine uh, winning, they're not in a frame of mind that would would say let's uh, let's uh, surrender, so to speak, and and tell people to come in and then we'll just pursue nonviolent resistance. But if they were to do so, especially with the sanctions being maintained by the rest of the world against Russia and Russian uh, oil, uh, I think they would have a better chance of winning. Then, um, uh, in fact, I would I would think they're going to win anyway. In the sense that you you couldn't you know there are 44 million Ukrainians, and it would take at least a million soldiers to occupy them and force them to do things. And they don't have that many soldiers, so I think the Ukrainian uh, will they would not be able to to uh, really occupy and control Ukraine. But right now, you can't do much to you can't do anything in Russia to to uh, 
uh, encourage any civil resistance because you're going to get people shot if they go out in the street. You know, the, the army will, the police will take them away. Um, so there, it's very dangerous to ask people to be uh, overtly uh, organizing an uh, resistance to Putin's government in, in Russia. And you can't do anything to get the Ukrainians to adopt these nonviolent methods. The best I can think of that we could be doing right now is sending drones over the uh, Russian troops where they're stopped in various convoys and so on and drop leaflets saying, okay, if you guys want to give up, don't want to fight, because a lot of them certainly don't want to fight, then uh, come here. We have a place where you can have a safe haven. You just come out with your hands up or wear, you know, waving a white flag or piece of paper or something that's white, and you surrender, and we will put you in a special place where you'll be safe throughout the war. And then when you're through, if you don't want to go back to Russia because it, they may be hard on you, We'll see to you that you can go to another country and we'll set you up to uh, start life over again. So I, I think that they would get, if we did that right now with, you know, they could have these drones flying over and dropping these leaflets. We could get quite a few of the Russian soldiers to actually comply with that. Many of them are doing it voluntarily anyway. What do you think? I'll let yeah. respond. <laughs> I, I was going to let you respond. Uh, <laughs> well, I but, could, but I'd like to hear from you too. Well, I guess it's it's a little bit like like the, that solution. I can see so many uh, things to the contrary. It's a little bit like the uh, no fly zones or the uh, uh, let's overthrow Putin uh, that uh, that that we're hearing from the U.S. right, and people who couldn't find Ukraine on the map uh, a month ago uh, and probably still can't are pronouncing what, what you do. And uh, and then, of course, if you don't agree with those types of things, uh, then you have no compassion, according to them. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, not even recognizing the counterproductiveness of that. I guess the, the problem with this would be uh, if you end up... Uh, 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 firstly, you've got soldiers who are largely not going to see your media and and, and may not uh, uh, really have the types of viewpoints that we have. But even if you do have a few, and, and we certainly have seen that that they are uh, there, that that you end up creating this the safe zone, and that that'll be the first thing that gets bombed because. Russian intelligence would still be enough that they'd be able to find these so-called safe areas. Uh, but but, uh, but I know that that's just one idea that you have, Meta. It's just a way of trying to give hope to people who are willing to act uh, nonviolently. And I think that probably, yes, we can look at other, uh, other ways that would be similar. It is really tough when you do have the representatives of the Ukrainian people and Zelensky in particular saying that what he wants wanted wasn't a ticket out. He wanted arms. And mm -hmm. it's, it's tough when people are resisting uh, overwhelming force against them to not really um, say that you're going to do what, what they want you to do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. In Ukraine, there is a whole um, movement of uh, of nonviolent resistors. Um, I think they're mostly mostly youth, and and similarly in in Russia, I think most of the the peace movement are young people. So that there are in both countries and. I remember at one point there was a mean, some organization was making possible our sending messages to to those young people in both countries. And uh, I wish that, you know, we could all be encouraged to keep sending them messages of support. And I mean, their bravery. And I mean, it right now, and, and not just in Ukraine, I mean, it's everywhere. We still have that 
that idea that the soldier going out to war with, with the arms is the person who is, loves his country and is brave and honorable and, and whatnot. Uh, whereas the, the persons who risk their lives just as much using the nonviolent resistance are not given much notice at all. And yet it is. I mean, it's a very valid, powerful way of dealing with conflict. Um, so I, you know, I mean, I see our peace movement as somehow trying to build up that different image that the nonviolent path is equally um, powerful and deeply courageous uh, as a way to, to express their, their desire to protect the values of their country and their people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that whole, you know, as we talk about culture of peace, culture of war, we're so caught up in the culture of war, which of course embraces militarism as the way to peace. <laughs> You know, it's it's also and and so it it really in the end it's it's counterproductive to talk about winners and losers because really we all know at least we in the peace movement know that the real winners are the weapons industry and the fossil fuel industry. They are the winners, and what's happening in around this war in Ukraine is that what it, what's happening. All the countries that can produce oil and or gas are being asked to <laughs> pull more out of the ground. And the weapons industry is having a boom. So now Canada has just announced yesterday the decision to buy the F-35 Lockheed Martin new fighter jets, mm -hmm. which other countries in Europe and the US, of course, have already chosen to do. So can you imagine the wealth that Lockheed Martin is about to start pulling in? Unbelievable. And the whole thing of what that money could be used for. Do we okay, want- Okay, you know, Mary Ellen, I of course agree with you, but that is a longer, uh, a, a, a wider perspective than people could afford if you were in ukraine right now i don't think you could talk that way to be honest because if you're talking about how if you're sitting there and you know that in another three minutes there's going to be bombs coming down on you on your house on your theater where you've got a thousand people trying to find refuge and people are going to be bombing you it is is it's really, I mean, we are being frankly oblivious to something important if we simply say, well, why don't you try nonviolence? Huh? How can you try nonviolence when you've got to protect yourself from or find a way of surviving against an attack? We have to find things that can be done now to actually help protect people. And and I, I see your your point. There are lots of people who don't want, there are people in Ukraine who don't want to use violence. So what do they do? How can they be helpful? What they're doing is going around delivering food to people. That's the medicine or taking, trying to help people move around when they need to and so on. But if we, if, you know, there is no uh, immediate um, way that I can say that using nonviolence is available to protect people. Uh, the only thing that I can do is imagine ways in which you can get the soldiers, the Russian soldiers, to defect and and stop doing what they're doing. And, and that is why I, I introduced this notion of dropping leaflets on them, because we know that already their morale is in the pits. Those people do not want to be there. The soldiers didn't know they were going to be sent into war, even a two days or before the invasion started, they didn't even know they were going to be actually attacking. They were sitting on the periphery of the country waiting. 
and and they didn't they're not trained and they're not able to survive and they're a the fat fantastic number of them are being killed so they are willing to defect and a lot of them actually are defecting but there is no known mechanism for them to do so so what we want to i think the only constructive solution i would have is to say give them some mechanism for giving up and saying i don't want to kill you guys and so here i will surrender or you can you can do what you will with me but i'm not going to fight you so and i don't want to i don't want to you know in the long term you're you're right mary ellen it's the the winners are the people with the with the money and the oil and stuff but it's also true that the people in europe are going to need to keep their houses warm in next winter and if they refuse this nord stream 2 uh pipeline they're going to have to figure out how to get along without the gas and if they don't and and then the russians may say or putin may say if you cut off if you don't let us uh, open up Nord Stream 2, we'll cut off Nord Stream 1, and then you're really in tr trouble because you depend on it completely. So that, then we've got to find a way to get oil to them and gas to them. I don't like it either. Uh, and in fact, I'm really enthusiastic about something that Bill McKibben wrote or said on, I think it was CBC the other day. He said, you know, this is an opportunity for us to immediately start producing huge numbers of uh, things like heat pumps and insulation and other things that will enable people in Europe to get along without this gas or without this oil. We should be shipping, uh, instead of Stinger missiles and, and uh, Javelin uh, missiles and so on, we should be sending ships loads full of uh, equipment to Europe to enable them to make the transition quickly to uh, fossil fuel free, uh, uh, heating and, and uh, survival, uh, starting, you know, maybe next October. It certainly is a, a oh. moment to, to, uh, to speed up the transition to, to green energy. If, if nothing else, this definitely should push the whole world to move rapidly mm -hmm. into transition. Again, it's not going to help people in the moment but at least if they feel like, hey, we've got a plan and we're moving to a different way that's going to take us away from the dependency, um, that the whole economy of the world is, is going to change. So I, and obviously it's not one thing, it's, it's several, many things all working together. And it's how, what, what can keep helping people to to see the value of different ways. That's why the physicians, I really appreciate all the work that the physicians have done in constantly bringing in the dimension of health because uh, I think that that does awaken people mm -hmm. to realize when things are going to affect my health. Um, mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I mean. I feel that the, the physicians movement have been tremendous in constantly bringing us back to that reality rather than it being, you know, stuff up there that it's all heady and ideas. No, let's get down to brass tacks. It's going to affect health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, IPPNW does have uh, a statement that came out yesterday or the day before that Nobel Peace Prize winners uh, all signed, uh, a number of them, and they had a, a very good webinar on the uh, page about the possible involvement of nuclear weapons. So if people are interested in that. Uh, I've got a few other little things uh, related, not, uh, a bit disjointed again, but uh, related to other things that we you might want to consider in the future, Meta. Mm -hmm. One is uh, the issue of the breadbasket of, uh, of much of the world and uh, much of the Middle East now perhaps being compromised by this war and what that's going to mean to uh, people's uh, welfare in countries that are already rather fragile. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I guess uh, uh, if things last longer, that, that, that may be a challenge. Uh, yeah, another... uh, in, in terms of the wheat, for example, I think mm -hmm. I understand that the Ukraine and Russia are the major suppliers of 
of uh, wheat for the for, for the bread of the Middle East, especially the Middle East. They are very dependent on that. Now I don't know whether it's too late. Uh, let me think. When do you plant? When do they plant wheat? I mean, the the whole uh, agriculture uh, business has been disrupted by the war, and either they don't want to sell the wheat or will not have any wheat to sell. But also, I'm not sure. Uh, what the timing is? Is it too late to fix this? Um, is there still time for the uh, production of wheat to to be resumed in time to get uh, food to, uh, especially the Middle East? It's certainly another impetus to um, to stopping the war because, as you're pointing out, Meta, uh, the supply of of Wheat. So, I mean, it, the, the countries of the world, the most vulnerable, you know, going into food crisis and even fertilizer, you know, I mean, it, things that we haven't really thought of. So, I mean, it has such global implications, uh, th this war. It's not local. It has huge world implications. Mm -hmm. And how much longer do we want the whole world to be uh, suffering from starvation or living in, in such insecurity. It, it's yeah, certainly uh, showing us that the, the present system just is disaster. Yeah, I'll give you a few other threads that you might want to uh, make something of. Uh, one would be in terms of the response, like renewables, uh, even though we would like to promote them in the uh, in the intermediate term and speed things up. In the short term, uh, countries are, uh, Germany's having to choose between coal and nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And other countries are, are taking uh, a different tack. And now, of course, in Canada, looking at small modular reactors mm -hmm. in several provinces. So people are looking at different solutions now and and i'm not sure we're all uh, on the same page in the peace movement uh, i'm also yeah. interested in um uh actually a couple of things about the world military and social expenditures report that ruth leger savard did back in the 90s mm -hmm. and whether anybody's trying to do anything like that uh now um i also um was thinking about what is the end game really in ukraine uh, now, because it does seem like Ukraine being neutral is something that uh, Zelensky has said that he would be willing to have Russia maybe moving its forces back to just uh, the Donbass region and trying to have uh, some control over more of that and, uh, and maybe something more in terms of autonomy of Crimea. Uh, what do you see as being... The, the thing that uh, they're going to end up having to gr agree on because Ukraine is not going to be able to gain back its entire territory. Uh, regardless, Russia is not going to be able to control uh, Ukraine uh, uh, fully, but in terms of the uh, that neutrality uh, and what is it going to mean for the other countries uh, on the borders of Russia? Well, as a matter of fact, last night I was actually writing an editorial, trying to, or a piece for Peace Magazine, which is going to press soon, uh, I, I, where I said what I think the projection is. And of course, most of the time that I made predictions, I've been wrong. But uh, so I'm probably going to be wrong this time. But what my prediction is, you've already mentioned two of the end game uh, positions that the Zelensky is going to adopt. He said that he would accept neutrality. He's acknowledged that they will not be part of NATO. He's also, I think, probably the next step will be that he'll compromise on the amount of autonomy that the Donbass uh, republics will be able to have within within Ukraine if they're accepted as if Russia will let will accept a ceasefire on those terms. But then the real sticking point is Crimea. 
uh, because I don't see either side backing down on that. Both the Russians want, want to contain, re retain Crimea and, and U Ukraine will never acknowledge that it won't. So the only um, interim solution that I can imagine is uh, at all likely is that the um, that both sides would uh, negotiate to uh, allow the Crimean situation to remain in, in the cur current status quo, but as a to be decided later kind of thing. Let's the way I think you know India and and Pakistan uh, kind of bracketed uh, the uh, the status of Kashmir. Uh, and, and said, "Well, we we won't uh, hold up um, the end of the the war uh, or the conflict in order to uh, solve that because we can't solve it right away." So they they bracketed it as to be solved later, and then came to some some sort of interim uh, stalemate. And uh, I, my guess is that that's the kind of solution that will be forthcoming. And I hope the sooner sooner the better. Do you guys agree with me or would you project a, a totally different uh, outcome? I'm not a political scientist. Uh, I'm with the Ball Silly School for International Affairs, but I, I can't uh, hope to pronounce uh, on that. I'm not sure that uh, the uh, Kashmir uh, solution <laughs> is necessarily a very positive uh yeah, it uh, certainly thing. isn't yeah but it <laughs> might be the best we got <laughs> maybe yeah i actually a more hopeful note uh maybe i was as you were talking earlier i was recalling in 19 in, in 2000 going to yugoslavia mm -hmm. uh and um with people who were more in the opposition and they took me to these rallies of people from otpor the young students who were resisting Milosevic. And really to a person at that time, they were uh, really feeling hopeless. They, they, they actually did want to get out of the country. They, uh, they, they were still marching for, uh, for rights there. They, that, this was a year after the NATO bombing. Uh, but uh, the, the, there was a total lack of hope. And six months later, Milosevic was gone. And uh, so uh, there is sometimes uh, things turn on a dime sometimes. Yeah, uh, you, don't, you just really don't know all the forces that are there. They're, they're maybe not obvious, but there's thing, all kinds of things happening where all of a sudden it's, it seems like all of a sudden, but it's not really. There have been <laughs> things happening. You know what strikes me too about this, this war <laughs> is that Canada, you know, has a history which we could really bring in the in, in the sense of not perfection but of an ongoing negotiation so we've got both the the whole issue of the french english in canada and the province of quebec that sees itself as a nation and as yet still within the, mm. the boundaries of canada and we also have the indigenous people who want to be seen as, you know, a separate entity. Um, and I mean, in both cases, we've not handled it very well, but we are all together still mm -hmm. and trying to work it out. Um, I like that idea. And uh, I thank you both. And uh, carry on. We will be no doubt have a more uh, more chance to discuss this and other thorny issues in the in the future. So have a good day and appreciate this. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to meet Thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Project Save the World produces one of these shows three days a week and sometimes more. This is episode number four hundred. You can watch these or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to savetheworld.ca. Eventually, we even post transcripts there. And when you get to that website, look around because we have conversations going on there all the time about six global issues and potential reforms in governance, 
economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. And after you've watched or listened, scroll down and share your own thoughts about the show with the other viewers. This is a place for dialogue, so please join in. We'll see you there.